Pleased, Deputy President, to rise and speak to the Governor's speech, congratulating you on your uh, re-election as Deputy President, uh, but also noting the service that the Governor has given to the people of Victoria. And I want to place on record my uh, respect and appreciation of her and, um, and Tony and the um, great work that they have done over their period in Government House. I was impressed that they were the first of the Commonwealth uh, jurisdictions to meet the new king. Um, and I, I welcome the additional award or the award that's been given by the new king for service uh, to uh, Linda Dessau, our governor in Victoria. Um, I think that that is uh, a, a marker of the service that she's given, uh, not just to King Charles III, but to um, the people of Victoria. Uh, but Noting that the Governor's speech is a speech written for her by the Government of the day, there are significant um, deficiencies in the Governor's speech. And um, when one looks quickly at the Governor's speech, um, you, you become alarmed that many of the key uh, issues have not been confronted. Um, if you look at health, and I, I, my eyes immediately went to health and I listened carefully as she spoke, uh, but there was nothing in the health discussion uh, that would deal with the massive growth in the waiting list under this government. As Health Minister, when I left on 30th of June 2014 was the last four years figures, uh, just over 38,000 Victorians were on the official um, waiting lists. Now in the mid 80,000s on the waiting list, a huge increase and an increase that had well and truly started before COVID. Um, that increase was obviously impacted by COVID, but we have the longest waiting list, I think, in the state's history, and huge lists in key locations, Monash and in my electorate, the um, Monash Health and um, Eastern Health and Alfred Health in particular service, and all of those health services have got ma massive waiting lists, and this is a direct and terrible, frightening impact on so many um, Victorians, particularly older Victorians, particularly vulnerable Victorians. And it appears the government is heartlessly uninterested in dealing with this. It seems incompetent and unable to deal with these, um, these um, problems. Um, I, I see the Heart Hospital, uh, the announcement of the Heart Hospital opening. Now, my, my information is it's not actually fully functional as yet. Um, and that comes from nursing staff within the hospital who indicate that it's on a, on a sort of a skeleton staff and they're trying to piece together enough people to run it. But the truth is that we announced um, that hospital in 2014. Uh, it was the Liberals who announced it first. Um, 130 million for a, a hospital to be built on the Monash Medical Centre site. And the Labor Party uh, sought to match that policy. What they did not tell people is that they did not intend to build a remotely similar hospital, but to build a distant hospital on the Monash Medical, on the Monash um, Education Campus, uh, Monash University Education Campus, not near the hospital, which has involved uh, thereby the massive duplication of facilities, um, the massive duplication of um, urgent care and, um, sorry, of um, ICU and other, other facilities, including um, sterilising and kitchen facilities, a massive increase. Um, and the cost, and we'll wait and see what the final cost is, but all the information I have is that it's north of $550 million. How on earth you start off with a hospital, you know, somewhere between $100 and $200 million and end up with something north of $500 million is quite extraordinary. And they've been so slow to build it. Uh, that hospital, if we'd been in government, would have been built by the, end of 20, by the election in 2018. And that was Labor's commitment too. Um, it's extraordinary to go back and look at the public accounts and estimates. Hearings through that period um, between 2014 and 2018, and Jill Hennessy um, valiantly trying to explain uh, when it would be finished and what the cost would be. And every time the questions were asked, the cost was going up and up and up. Um, it, it, my information is that the cost will be significantly north of $550 million. And 2023, 
I'll let people do the arithmetic from 2014. That is nine years, not four years. It's five years late and three times, more than three times the original budget. Now, how on earth you can be so incompetent, so just blindingly incompetent, that they could um, uh, fail to manage that project properly from the start. A needed project, a project announced by the coalition, a project announced in government by the coalition, but a project delivered nine years after, five years late, and more than three times the original cost estimates uh, that Labor themselves had put on it. So these uh, health issues are very significant, and I noticed the um, inadequate funding for um, many of the health projects that are listed by the government in this um, uh, governor's speech. The New Royal Melbourne and the New Royal Women's are not fully funded. There's a bit over $2 billion there. They're going to need north of six and a bit billion dollars, and there seems to be some doubt about even that figure and whether it is um, larger. And the campus is being split. Um, this is, uh, I think, a suboptimal outcome in many regards, splitting the campus. They say they want to put the outpatients and other um, facilities down in the new Arden um, corner. Um, all of this designed to prop up the, um, the metro. And the metro itself is a case study in how not to conduct projects. If you look at the, at the work on the metro, it's at least $3 billion over budget. And there are still many significant problems in, with the, uh, the Metro that I am aware of, that many people are well aware of, and they will come to um, fruition or to, to public notice in the next um, period. But $3 billion, how do you get these projects so wrong? How do you get them so incompetently uh, focused? It's just bizarre. And um, we, you know, we've seen today Corey Hannett resign. Um, and uh, I think that that is, um, uh, that is um, quite extraordinary uh, and we need proper explanations about, um, you know, our, our controller generally had a funny title and, you know, you sort of thought it was a little bit Gilbert and Sullivan-like, really, um, the, the calling him the controller general, the head honcho, the director of traffic, um, uh, you know, and he, uh, he is gone, but let's face it, um, the choices to replace him are not great either. Uh, Devlin, I understand Kevin Devlin is going in there and he comes from a disgraceful background in the performance with the Level Crossing Removal Authority, rolling over local communities. And we've heard in the last few days the behaviour of the Level Crossing Removal Authority um, in uh, Surrey Hills and Mont Elbert, the disgraceful behaviour. Even last night on the news, it's disgraceful activities in terms of... Um, its uh, untruthful communications with uh, local residents. And we saw last night a local resident who'd been told they would be able to access their home and they can't get in there for, for many months to come. Uh, but the big whopper that was told there, the big lie told by the, uh, the government and the local member ahead of the 2018 election is you'd get um, the two level crossings removed at Mont Elbert and at Surrey Hills. Um, but you would get two new stations built. Now, they, they culled that and they're actually only building one new station. Um, again, shamefully uh, misleading the community. The truth on level crossings, of course, is that they have never once released the final costings of any single level crossing that has been built under this government. There is no reason why level crossing um, costs uh, after the completion of the project could not be released. And indeed, in my view, they should be released. Um, it's very clear that, um, that the huge cost blowouts in level crossing um, costs, particularly for each and almost every level crossing, um, are a big part of the government's reluctance to release this information. They don't want to release this information because it's embarrassing. It's deeply embarrassing. And the truth is that um, um, the first tranche of level crossings was one cost, the next tranche, half the number, was about the same cost. And the truth of the matter is that money has been moved from the second program into the first to prop up the uh, underestimates in the first. And um, we certainly support level crossing removals. We 
uh, did a number of them in government, uh, Springvale being one of the, the main ones, but also commenced uh, crossings like at Burke Road. These are important steps, uh, but they've got to be completed still on time and on budget. Uh, projects that are likely twice the budget of the original uh, cost estimates are, um, are, are um, much less good value for, um, for public money. And all of the business cases, noting, noting the government commenced the level crossing moving, uh, removals before doing a business case, then they did a business case, but how does the business case look um, later, when the costs are at least double in many cases, um, how do the business cases look in a, uh, do, does it stack up since? Is this the right spending in the right place in the right way? Um, are legitimate questions that people can ask. But of course, uh, the details of the costs, the details of the um, outcomes for each and every level crossing have never, ever been released. We've asked for it in this chamber. We've asked for it at public accounts. It's been asked for at PAYAC. Um, it's been asked for at, um, at FOI and the government has fought and fought and fought on every occasion not to release that basic uh, information. Um, but this is a government too where uh, these projects, wherever you look, are out of control. Even very good, you know, recently opened projects like the Mordialic Bypass, 40% over budget. Years late, 40% over budget. Huge, huge failings in these projects to deliver on time and on budget. And there is, a, there is a real issue, in fact, with the performance of the government in terms of its ability to deliver on key services. So whether it's health, the emergency services are in crisis. We've heard again and again about the failure of the triple zero service, the failure of the ambulance service. We've heard again and again about the failure of the um, government to get its elective surgery uh, targets and the failure to actually get people in for surgery and get them out in a reasonable time according to the rules. And the waiting list is blown out. We know that the homeless uh, situation, we had a, 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 a question in the chamber today that, that touched onto the homelessness uh, issue. So when it comes to basic services, this government can't deliver. Um, they can't seem to deliver uh, properly. In education, we've seen a fall in performance in a number of key areas of literacy and numeracy. And they are the basic measures. These are really very important measures uh, of actual outcomes uh, for the community, actual results, actual uh, final outcomes for individuals who are affected by government services. And whether it comes to trains and trams, I mean, we, we don't, the trams are not performing uh, well. The trains have lifted their performance uh, somewhat, but they are only still on two thirds of the volume from pre uh, from um, pre COVID from 2019. So on 20, they're now meeting their targets, but they've only got two thirds of the passengers. So you know, it's a little bit like it's a little bit like that you know famous Yes Minister Hospital in the Midlands, isn't it? That seemed to work very well when it didn't have the people going through it. Um, and this is where we are with, when it comes to public transport. V-Line has been a basket case and remains a, a basket case in terms of performance. Um, but those performance uh, metrics that the people would expect to see reliability, you know, if you look at the Albury wodonga line, um, Ms Lovell understands the non-performance of that line, and I just picked that as, as a, an example of a, a country service where uh, the performance has not been up to scratch for the whole period of this government. It's declined from where it was in 2014 and has never reached the performance level that the previous government uh, achieved. And that is true also in the metro um, system when by 2019 the performance had de you know, declined so dramatically um, with not only the, um, the issues of reliability but the issues of punctuality as well. And the government's solution to the punctuality issue, of course, is to do something like put a new timetable in that's a slower timetable. Actually, a slower timetable is an outcome that the people did not want. The people did not want a slower timetable. They wanted a faster timetable. If it takes you an extra four minutes to get from Melbourne to Cranbourne or from Melbourne to Caulfield, that's a poor outcome. Um, even though the government starts meeting its metrics now, but meeting its, its weakened recordings of metrics and meeting them in the circumstance where it's only carrying two-thirds 
of the passengers. So when I, I looked at the governor's speech, and you know, as I've said, I have a high level of respect for uh, Linda Dassault, our governor, and the work that she's done, and I wish her well after she retires in, in June. But what I found glaringly absent was a focus on actual performance and outcomes for the community. Actual results, whether it be in health, whether it be in education, whether it be matters with homelessness, whether it be in transport, all of these. Housing, uh, Ms Lovell uh, will, will, will point out very closely that the housing failure under this government is just extraordinary. The waiting list has grown massively since she was minister and the waiting list, the waiting list is um, a, a shocking outcome in the sense people are now waiting routinely many, many years to get into public 60 housing. A 60% increase, increase in the period since 2014. So that is again a performance measure, a performance measure that actually directly impacts on community and on people. Uh, families that can't get into public housing have every right to be angry, have every right to be furious with this government that has actually presided over that failure in performance. So whether it's housing, whether it's transport, or whether it's um, in education, whether it's in health, that performance has slipped and slipped badly under this government. And I think the community should be unhappy about that. And all of this has happened while the government is ratcheting up debt. So before the 2018 election, we saw the then Treasurer walk out and say, no, we're going to lift debt to GSP, the gross state product, from 6% to 12%. Well, now it's up near 20%. And it's heading to somewhere north of 25, 26, 27% 27 on the, on the projections going forward. And as interest rates climb, it's going to put further and further pressure on that borrowing. And people will remember um, that now Victoria's debt is scheduled to be bigger than um, New South Wales, Queensland and Tasmania combined. And that is a very significant um, failure of performance of this government. And much of that, much of that has gone into um, project overruns, cost overruns, cost overruns on major projects. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr Davis. I might... Um, the cost. Thank you. Thank you um, for extending